But as I wrote this paper, of course, it ended up becoming the preface to something I'd like to write. So you won't find much about Adelas in here. No. So uh, I'm going to be talking about three interrelated concepts, religion, the world, and place. Uh, I focus on Andean thought following European colonization of the Americas. And by Andean, I mean both the land of the Andes mountain range, as well as a way of thinking. Andean thought consists of the many traditions and ways of knowing that have originated from the inhabitants of the Andes expressed in many languages, though my focus is on the languages of Quechua and Aymara. My effort in this paper is to outline the difficulties in thinking through the idea of religious place. The larger purpose of this presentation is to think through a decolonial framework in order to open up questions and points of access for thinking the relation between the local and the global by way of the concept of world. This presentation works towards a decolonial thinking of religious place by progressing through three parts. An outline of European modernity's epistemic categories, a decolonial analysis of these categories, and a rethinking of the relation between religion and place. My preliminary thesis is that thinking depends on its coordinates in the world. So thinking beyond Eurocentrism and monotheism or thinking other than it means rethinking how our thought coordinates and is coordinated. Andean thought has grappled with this question, at least I contend, since the advent of colonialism, and I believe much of it remains to be thought through. A common thread across critiques and analyses of European modernity is the recognition of how the concept of the construct is central to its epistemology. By epistemology, I mean the ways in which we think of and organize knowledge. In developing this point regarding modernity and the construct, I draw upon the work of American philosopher David R. Lachterman and his 1989 book, The Ethics of Geometry. Lachterman bases his understanding of ethics on its ancient Greek origins and Aristotle's ethos. For Aristotle, ethos refers to the ways available to beings for acting in the world with each other and with their own selves. Lachterman identifies a difference in ethics between the treatment of geometry by ancient Greek mathematician Euclid and French philosopher René Descartes. In the case of Euclid and the ancient Greeks, the geometric figure is intelligible by the nature of the figure itself. In the case of Descartes and modern Europeans, the geometric figure is intelligible by way of strategies and tactics that bring that figure into visibility. This distinction is crucial for Lachemann, where he points out a distinction in the manner of knowing entails a difference in the mode of being. Lachemann's study is valuable, though not unique, because it centers mathematics. Mathematics, along with physics, gets taken up often as an example of a pure scientific knowledge that this gets away from any particular social or cultural meaning. There's good reason to doubt there's such a thing as a pure knowing or at least a pure mathematics. Purity here refers to a knowledge transcendent of conditions, whether those are social, historical, or material. As American philosopher Sandra Harding observes, it is plausible to think that the possibility of pure mathematics is a myth for two reasons. The first is that no conceptual system can provide the justificatory grounds for itself. And the second is that the plausibility of what seem like impossible mathematical concepts um, end up having to be socially negotiated to make sense of them. Right? Something like the idea of um, the set of sets containing more sets than a set larger than one. Um, I don't get it myself, but luckily there's mathematicians who can explain this. Uh, Lachterman focuses on math in order to challenge the continuity of the history of mathematics across ancient and modern math uh, and genealogically locates the emergence of modernity. The ethical orientation of this modernity entails being carried along from the recognition of the constructivity of mathematics to self-deification. We move from a paradigm where the mind is nature's mirror to a paradigm that takes the mind as the producer or source of nature. So what does it mean to say that the constructivity of math leads to self deification This means that gods are no longer superhuman as they were for the ancient Greeks, nor is God still a transcendent horizon against which our material world is understood by. By this understanding of modernity, there is no post-modernity. For the idea that everything is a construct is much older than the late 1900s, and it implicates those philosophers known as rationalists, idealists, materialists. 
At the center of modernity is the idea that the mind constructs the world. And this includes those categories by which we understand ourselves and that world. <clears throat> so how is this paradigm of constructivity reflected or what's an example of it? I set an alarm to wake up in time to begin to work and drink coffee. Um, in today's case, I look up time zones and completely confuse myself and miss the original time of my presentation. Um, the Argentinian philosopher Rodolfo Kush might say that we operate with an instrumental rationality organized around our subjective willing. In his 1970 Indigenous and Popular Thinking in America, Kush writes that our sense of freely willing this or that action is mediated, quote, by the idea of a humanity that progresses in a cumulative sense, multiplying freedoms and objects, always polishing the rational attitudes. We understand according to given categories that are governed by a scientific order which measures the rationalities of, by which we measure the rationality of our actions. The modern paradigm of constructivity entails a change in our religious ethos as well. It may be more accurate to instead say that religion emerges as a category of modernity. It's useful here to refer to the distinction between descriptive and redescriptive accounts often used in anthropology. Descriptive accounts aim to describe social phenomena in the same language used by the people it describes. While well, redescriptive accounts freely use any categorization system to describe phenomena, whether or not the people themselves use it. So it's common to describe many uh, spiritual practices of people as religious, and of course, the same problem exists here with the word spiritual. Uh, but it would be inaccurate to say that many spiritual practices would have self-identified as religious. It's common for aspects of Abrahamic religions, particularly Christianity, to come to stand in for religion as a whole. This has led to generalizing the concept of religion in a way similar to math, just as it's assumed people have universally developed systems of arithmetic. So it is assumed that people have universally developed a kind of internal spirituality and desire for salvation. Well, it might be more common, if not universal, that people have cosmologies Cosmology is not the same as a religion. As the French philosopher Rami Vray uh, puts it, uh, cosmology is an account of the world in which a reflection on the nature of the world as a world must be expressed. So religion strikes me as a word to be skeptical of, but it's important to describe how it functions as a category of knowledge in uh, our modern epistemology. As the Saudi Arabian anthropologist Talal Assad suggests, modern religion is determined primarily by the concept of the secular. The secular is typically understood as the non-religious, but Assad suggests that secularism is primarily, quote, an enactment by which a political medium, in this case, representation of citizenship, redefines and transcends particular and differentiating practices of the self that are articulated through class, gender, and religion. This differs from pre-modern kinds of mediation that navigate local identities without orienting themselves uh, through some transcendent uh, in between. The key aspect of modern religion with regard to secularism is the way in which it legitimates certain peoples and practices at the same time it denies others. This is clear in the distinction that modern liberal democracies make between the public and the private, a respected or majority religion, uh, and its practices form part of the fabric of public life. While minority religions are defined by their inability to respect the secular distinction, just keeping their practices to themselves. A clear example of this is the ubiquitous nature of the Bible in the American state, as well as the Christian verbiage found in American currency. So for the most part, I've narrated Western modernity's own self-perception. Modern categories of knowledge are objective organizations of kinds of knowledge. These categories don't limit themselves to the regional or local, but apply to and arise out of the global. Now, I mean, they apply to the global in the sense that secularity or math are not considered to be culturally specific untranslatable words, but intend to describe phenomena that are not specific to a particular locale. And I mean, they arise out of the global in the sense that modern categories of knowledge emerge along with global economy and worldwide capitalism. The Peruvian sociologist, Anibal Quijano, asserts that modernity and coloniality are two sides of the same event that begins with the colonization of the Americas. For Quijano, coloniality and colonialism are distinct concepts. Colonialism names the explicit political order. 
Uh, and coloniality refers to the enduring structures of knowledge captured in the concept of modernity rationality. Modernity rationality is an epistemological paradigm of knowledge uh, that's defined as knowledge as something produced out of a subject-object relation. Knowledge and power work in tandem to exert and legitimate colonial exploitation enacted not only through disappropriation, but epistemically as well. The coloniality of power names the global imposition of a paradigm of knowledge historically accomplished by European colonization. Maybe it might be more accurate to say begun by colonization. From 1492 onwards, things come to be known in relation to the European. Uh, as Europe is the center and the rest of the world is defined in relation to it. This paradigm may be referred to as Eurocentricity, as it names the ways in which our coordinates of existence are defined in relation to our existence or proximity to Europe, ideally and materially, uh, and as well as time zones, I suppose. The social category of race emerges out of European colonialism and undergirds the coloniality of power. Social identities are produced out of this meeting, exploitation and domination of peoples, such that one's external appearance becomes a manifestation of their interiority. Coloniality of power bases itself, but is not exhausted off the racial classification of people. This consolidation of power under the paradigm of European modernity rationality and the economic rationality of capitalism organizes the world and its contents, promoting and maintaining itself economically, forcefully, and epistemologically. Hihano and others' interventions in naming this system form the decolonial critique of modernity. And by decolonial, I'm referring here to a strain of uh, Latin American, North American thought focused on interrogating the relation between colonialism and epistemology, predominantly out of the Latin American context. So I don't mean to suggest Quijano is the first to observe this process, nor that he stands in for anti-colonial, post-colonial, and decolonial thinking as a whole. Now, the problem I wanted to trace was the absence of a world by which we coordinate ourselves or else orient ourselves by. In his 1993 book, The Sense of the World, the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy writes that there's no longer any world, no longer a mundus cosmos composed in complete order from within which one might find a place. And in his 2002 follow-up, The Creation of the World, he writes that the struggle of putting into play a world is a struggle of the West against itself, of capital against itself. Nancy either does not consider or is not interested in the struggle to think about the world that occurs beyond what is considered Western. And it's a shame as the global South has been confronted with this problem since 1492. I like the language from the fourth declaration of the Lacondon jungle um, where the Zapatista is more meaningful. We want a world in which many worlds fit. Incidentally, the Zapatistas just built a boat and they're gonna sail to Europe. It's a very <laughs> exciting thing. I recommend looking it up. The particular issue I bring the question of the world to bear on is religious place. Thus far, I've outlined an understanding, um, and in some cases, a lack thereof of religion in order to ask how it is we can think of the objects that the category of religion determines beyond its categories. Keeping in mind the coloniality of power and modernity rationality, how do we read texts that we can at least hesitatingly say belong to religious tradition? In order to ground this question, I submit the Wadochidi manuscript as an example. In the introductory essay to the English translation, the American anthropologist Frank Salomon writes that the Wadochidi manuscript, quote, alone of all colonial sources, records a pre-Hispanic religious tradition of the Andes in an Andean language. Um, in a similar register, in a way I haven't explored yet, um, Jose Maria Arguedas also translated the Wadochidi manuscript from the original Quechua. Um, and there, Arguedas calls it um, a miniature Bible. So at the outset, I know it's already a significant determination of the text to say it's a religious text. Yet it remains difficult without that word to discuss all that is in that text that seem religious um, or else lack the language to be described otherwise, for myself anyways. The manuscript is the product of the presumed narration of what could be called origin myths and legends to Father Francisco de Avila in 1608. As Solomon notes in a different article where he discusses wakas, a Quechua word that roughly translates as shrine, 
The manuscript is written in the colonial Quechua language of the time that was influenced by the church's labors towards making the former language of the Inca into an evangelical interlingua. So um, they were not necessarily disconnected from the largely Aristotelian and Augustinian philosophic discussion that lies in the background of Peruvian evangelization. From what is known of the manuscript, it can be said it's a compendium of testimonies from various villages on the Western Andean Heights overlooking Lima, along with some editorializing by the Quechuan who gathered the stories. Now the challenges in reading this as a path to understanding the Andean world are not just in the translation from oral tra uh, traditions to written Quechua following the translation into Spanish and English, but coming to terms with the metaphysics that underlie the language um, as regards the Aristotelian and Christian inheritance. And finally, the challenge of the hermeneutics of the text itself. Talal Asad presents this problem with uh, regard to the Bible, um, specifically a book called The Bible Designed to Be Read as Literature. It came out in the 1920s, I think, and the book looks literary. Right? The Bible um, is presented without its division into columns um, and verse numberings. Right? So it looks like a novel. So this brings to attention uh, form and context. In what way does the frame and category uh, by which we come to know a thing predetermine the way that we read it? Does the fact that the book is called the Wadochiri manuscript mean we shouldn't read it like a Bible? Does the problem change at all if we do read it like a Bible? Are we not moving in the same ambit? Like many early indigenous texts cataloged, created or preserved by Spanish colonists, and the Guadalquivir manuscript references places in the world. Places are not necessarily or exclusively something defined by a set of coordinates that indicate the location of something on the globe. Phenomenon of huacas illuminates this point. Huacas are not a Quechuan word, or they are a Quechuan word, um, translated as shrines, as I noted above, but also as holy sites, spirits, and sacred environments. They're not just static objects, but they pass through states in varying speeds. The narrative of Chaupi Nyamka concerns a waka that freezes into a stone with five arms who, according to the manuscript, is hidden when the Spaniards arrive. This story also gives an example of a crucial point. Andean ways of being did not simply disappear when the Spanish arrived, right? which means, in other words, that um, the Andean texts and stories themselves incorporate the Spanish. And it's on a one-way street. So in this story, Chaupinyamka, or of Chaupinyamka, a huaca named Dukanakoto, which means finger-shaped mountain in Quechua and Aymara, appears and satisfies Chaupinyamka with their, quote, big cock. This leads Chaupinyamka to declare that only this being alone among all the other huacas is a real one. So they turn to stone and stay forever in Mama, or a village now called San Pedro. So in the background, it's the question of how do we interpret this story? Um, and you know, for more context, I relied or draw heavily on Irene Silverblatt and her writings on um, uh, American understandings of gender. It's contingently granted that the Wadochiri manuscript and the oral tradition it is based on is religious or at minimum definitively cosmological knowledge. It follows that villages and mountains are not just sociological or geographical objects, but something more. In the 1973 book, God is Red, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe member and law professor, Vine Deloria Jr. writes that many Christians will vehemently argue that the places at which religious experiences take place are of no consequence. For God is, quote, everywhere at all times. Now, this idea that um, Deloria is critiquing discounts the way that religion occurs in specific places and lends itself well to the privileging of economic rationality above all else. If the religious sense of a place is mere superstition or delusion, the land can be dispensed with according to the law of the secular state or needs of the market. This problem conceals a second problem. It's not only a question of whether or not modern epistemology should accord religion a privileged place, but the very order of epistemology itself. Will modern settler colonial states very well feel comfortable in distinguishing between the religious and the secular Modern critiques have made clear that the categories are anything but stable, even within their Western ambit of monotheism or atheism. This local debate includes the larger problem of the grounds of our categories of knowledge. 
for what counts as a place as alive as divine and what counts at all is by no means given nor is it ultimately the purview of scientific rationality while the critique of modernity rationality has been ongoing since its inception relatively little has been done in thinking out of the other ways of thought it has attempted to silence if not destroy so what i've aimed to do here is um, present two problems the way in which land is more than land um, and one path to recognizing this is understanding the second problem the ordering of our categories of knowledge that give meaning to our concepts of knowing dispensing and living to inquire into colonized forms of religion and life is not the same as inquiring out from them it is also not simply a matter of restitution for it would be reductive to assume that moving from a global model to a local one dispenses with the question of how we are to conceive of this world and locate ourselves within. However, we should definitely move for land back and decolonization. In any case, decolonization of land and mind is a necessary step towards thinking the world and as right-wing Christianity continues to grow in power across the world, it's necessary to grapple with religion beyond the ambit of scientific atheism and cultural Christianity. And that's all, thank you. Okay, we have five minutes. Questions, comments? Well, um, thank you very much, Richard, or Carter, I mean, uh, and um, so I think this has been incredible. I have, a, I have a question for Ricardo Carl. Yeah. Um, so thank you for do, dealing with Warajiri uh, manuscript. I'm just happy that anybody's even talking about it <laughs> um, uh, in the conference yeah. of it. So, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about this again in 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 relation to the question of um suma kase um kase or uh buen viver um which has been picked up sort of transnationally i hear people in india referring to it in some discourses um uh and then i think of um popova um a little bit further north uh, um, but I think about the manuscripts that we have of Popova now and how they become, you know, like the Huero Chiri manuscript, a kind of um, manual for genocide, at least the Popova was. And the, at least the translation I have, I think it's the same one that you have for the Huero Chiri. You, you can see the editorial remarks a little bit more um, that the priests have. So um, I'm just wondering... Um, uh it you know uh, about a sense of um you know you're reaching up to Vindaloria and um you know across central america i'm wondering if if in your reading and sensing of of place you um sense something that is particular to um abya yala or um turtle island these two continents specifically if not directly in the Andes. You're asking if I, uh, correct me if I overdetermine your question, if I sense like a commonality across the Ayala and um, Turtle Island with respect to place? Yeah, yeah, that, and, and it's okay if you don't. I, I'm just wondering if you do, it's, an, uh, it's a curious question. Yeah, it's, um. I struggle a lot with how to, I mean, at once committing to, you know, aiming to read locally and without overdetermination and tracking and managing and reflecting on the ways in which my mind ends up drawing links between um, disparate indigenous movements, right? Or like put another way, um, would I not be 
committing the same um, poor reading that I'm critiquing if I end up saying that these two texts across disparate times and places um, are the same in some way, right? Bound by their uh, their status as colonized. And, um, but um, the short answer is um, yes, right? That there's there seem to be a, like a like what I've kind of ran into as a problem with this paper because I don't end up saying much. Um, if you ended up having that impression, I think that's valid. Um, <laughs> is uh, that, that there's this kind of difficult question of the hermeneutics of a text in general, right? Um, along with the particular historic problems of a given text um, that I think does need to be negotiated productively with um, emphasizing um, the concept of indigeneity as a relational one and politically conducive one. And maybe to be less uh, jargon filled in my response, um, you know, that I try to work as an organizer though, recognizing my different place as an academic, it's not the same as an activist. So it's, um, Quite straightforwardly, I'm not as familiar with um, uh, the work of North American indigenous scholarship. Um, so maybe that's why I should say at the outset um, that I'm not quite qualified to comment, but I think there's productive links that we should start reading. Right? I think that there has been kind of disconnect between um, Turtle Island and Nadia Ayala mm -hmm. in terms of trying to think through um, both indigeneity as a political relation, um, as distinct from, uh, I guess, historical indigeneity. Sorry for the long response. I really thought I'd be shorter, but thank you for the question, Roger. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think about Barbara Alice Mann's work um, on the twinned cosmos, um, spirits of blood, spirits of breath, where she talks about the twinned cosmos sort of working across both continents, or Ward Churchill um, in the talk on Wednesday referred to Orrin Lyons, who's a Haudenosaunee um, uh, uh, leader, and and the Haudenosaunee. The, if you listen to Orrin Lyons, he he talks about sort of being part of that the the movement and um, toward uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People back in the seventies and how. Uh, groups from South America asked the Haudenosaunee to be the representatives because they had had a longer contact um, with some of the Europeans because um, they were from the eastern coast up here. And so uh, um, uh, they, they, for example, out of that exchange, they, they decided that they would use the term indigenous, right? That that would just be the term that that was used. But uh, anyway, Oran Lyons will refer to both continents as Turtle Island, but then in other contexts, it'll be Abiyala and Turtle Island. And um, I'm not sure exactly what the best way to go is, except that I don't like it when my colleagues just throw Popol Vuh into like a myth and literature class and they treat Popol Vuh or and no one's even teaching Guarachiri that I know of in my university. Um, but when they treat it, it's like, oh, well, this is like the 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 Mayan Odyssey, or something. It's like, no, it's not. It's just completely different. And it was a text that was put together to to stamp out practices or to identify. Um, and I think that that gets lost. Um, I'm gonna talk this a little bit over, but um, it's a really interesting paper. Thank you. <laughs>